Hey everybody, what's going on and welcome to GNR Central. And today I want to talk about how Duff revealed um, why he cried after Axl Rose sent him a text message. So this was made the news pretty recently. So our buddy Kevin went to Duff's show that he did at the Grammy Museum in Los Angeles on April 4th. Now, according to Blabbermouth, Duff talked about how Prince's death affected him and how Axel was the one who broke the news to him, saying the following, GNR were on the road, and if anybody has their thing, my thing is Prince. Duff continued by saying, he's the magical entity to me, and everybody has that record that saved your life. And 1999 gave me the, basically gave me the courage to get out of the junk-infested Seattle in 1983 and move to L.A., I was in Mexico City at the time, and we were playing with Guns N' Roses, and Axel texted me saying, I'm really sorry, turn on the news, because he knew, like my lifelong fandom, I actually cried when I heard the news. So if you guys have been reading Duff's book, or you've seen some of the interviews that he's done in the past, then you would know that Prince was a huge influence on Duff McKagan, and here's an interview where... Basically, Duff talks about the influence of the Prince album 1999 on him. Some of these records were soundtracks to my life. You know, we all have that record, um, or records. 1999 was a changing time for me, and that record came out and I discovered this Prince guy, you know? And, like, he plays everything on this, he does everything, he recorded it, he wrote all these songs. And the record was so all over the place, but it was a journey. And um, I went back and got controversy, and I got, got everything. I like, found singles and Bambi and all this stuff, and the first two records, and my God, this guy's amazing. I'd broken up with my first, you know, that first love you have in the breakup, and I was in a punk rock band, and I, and I was at, I didn't know what I was gonna do in life. I had heroin, it was coming to Seattle. And this record just sort of saved me from all of that, it protected me from the heartache and the heroin and what am I going to do? I could just re go to this record. It just was a, like a suit of armor. So come 1993, Duff McKagan releases his first solo record called Believe In Me. Now, it wouldn't really be a huge commercial success, but it was a good way for Duff to get out some of his musical ideas that he wasn't able to express in Guns N' Roses. And one of the songs that was featured on the record as a B-side was a cover of the Prince song Bambi. So if you guys want to listen to his cover of it, you can go to YouTube and just search it and you'll be able to find it pretty easily. Now, one thing that a lot of people probably know about Prince is that he didn't really like other artists covering his music. And the way cover songs kind of work is that you don't need the original artist who wrote the song's permission to cover their music. But anytime you cover someone's songs, most of the profits you would get from royalties go to the original songwriter. So Prince was pretty protective over his intellectual property and his music. He would never license his music to commercials. And it wasn't until after his death that you started to see his music creep up in, in things like commercials. Like I remember one in, in particular, there was a credit card commercial, I think it was for Capital One, and they had the Prince song, Let's Go Crazy. But you know, if Prince were still alive, he never would have licensed his music to that commercial. So in 2011, the AV Club published an article saying how Prince wanted to make covering songs illegal more specifically, Prince's songs. So according to the article, Prince, the world's biggest Prince fan, has a reputation for maintaining a tyrannical hold over his music, even going so far to sue his own devotees for using his songs and likeness in their worshipful sites. So he wasn't even a fan of his own fan sites. And also, of course, take them away from toddlers. So now he's out to extend that imperial control even further, saying during a recent interview on George Lopez's Lopez Tonight that he'd like to see the laws change to ensure that no one can cover one of his songs, Remarking on the compulsory licensing copyright that allows artists to rework other artists' hits, Prince said that doesn't exist in any other art form. Be it books, movies, there's only one version of Law & Order, and there's several versions of Kiss and Purple Rain. Of course, there are a few other things about this to disagree with. Number one, it's a compulsory licensing that does exist in other media, such as cable television. There are dozens of versions of Law & Order, and likely there will be at least one or two more uh, Law & Orders by the time you finish reading the sentence. So Prince covers other people's songs all the time, whether it be Radiohead's Creep, 
or the uh, the Super Bowl performance he did where he covered Foo Fighters Best of You, which came only after he'd blasted Foo Fighters for covering his own Darling Nikki song and told them to write their own tunes. So Prince shed a little bit more light on why he doesn't like people covering his music. He said, I don't mind fans singing the songs. My problem is when the industry covers the music. See, covering the music means that your version doesn't exist anymore. A lot of times people think that I'm doing Sinead O'Connor's song and Chaka Khan's song when in fact I wrote those songs. And it's okay when my friends ask them to do it, but there's there's one there's something called compulsory license law, which allows artists through record companies to take your music at will without your permission, and that doesn't exist in any other art form. Now, one thing that Prince kind of overlooks is that a lot of the times when artists cover other artists' songs, a lot of the monies and royalties goes to the original songwriter and not the band who actually covered the song. So there was an article that uh, Duff was featured in in 2011 where he gave an interview to the sunsetstrip.com and he revealed he would love to play with Prince. So he was asked, you'd play with everyone who's anyone. You've toured with mega barinas around the world. And what's left to do? Do you have any personal musicals left that you feel you need to accomplish? He said, I'd love to play with Prince. I played on the Iggy Pop record and he's my guy. I played with Steve Jones and he said, he's my guitar hero. Prince is the guy, probably the biggest musical influence all around for me, and I got to meet him one time, but I was so effing tongue-tied that I didn't know what to say. But to be able to play on a song or something like that, that would be pretty badass, just on a personal level. And you know, there's a hundred things I could have think of left to do, but it's been great so far, and I've never really sat there and thought about it, about what I've done so far and how does it feel. I probably should do that one day, but it's not happening yet. It's probably a good sign. And Axl Rose himself also ran into Prince at an award show, uh, one year and Prince him and him got talking and Axel revealed what they talked about in his conversation with Kurt Loder from 1990 just before the Use Your Illusion records came out. You seem to have, I mean, from a couple of years ago, like ODing on pills, you've come a long way since then. Do you feel more settled down now and you seem pretty relaxed and together? Yeah, but it's been a lot of work to do that because there's, you know, part of, we got used to like, as the Eagles would say, everything all the time. As and, the would say. <laughs> you know, living that way and going for it. And all of a sudden you started to really, and then that's what got us here. That's what got us signed. That's what got us on top of things. And then you started, then you got to a point where you go, wait a minute, everything that got me here is also starting to self, yeah. starting, I'm starting to self-destruct. It's starting to tear up my life. I have to figure out how to channel my energies other directions. It's, it's a weird one. Settling down is a weird one. <laughs> You know, do you think it's just a function of like getting older and, uh, and um, you know, learning more and being more aware of what's going on? It's around. realizing there's life after you know 21, life yeah. after 25, life after 27. You know, yeah. 27 was the hardest year. Um, I met Prince and I was talking with Prince and he was like, "How old are you? 28?" And he goes, "Last year was the hardest, wasn't it?" And he was saying how 27 is like the bitch. It's the hardest year. Really. Um, <laughs> 27 was definitely my hardest year. <laughs> well, it's all behind you now. Yeah, it's still a mess, but like I'm used to when it gets a mess. Yeah. So what's funny is that Slash gave an interview in 1991, and uh, he talked about the 1990 American Music Awards where him and Duff were visibly drunk and swore several times on stage and basically <laughs> made the censors rip their hair out. Now, during that interview that he did with Rolling Stone, Prince also came up. And it's one of the few times I've actually heard Slash talk about Prince. So he was interviewed by Rolling Stone and they asked, Speaking of booze, let's go back to this time last year in the American Music Awards. You gained national headlines when you nonchalantly said the F word on live television. What exactly happened that night? He said the F in Music Awards. What happened was I got this phone call the day of the show asking if I wanted to go. We were nominated for two awards and someone from the band needed to accept if we won. So me and Duff and our girlfriends all got drunk and flipped on down there uh, be f uh, to stop at Carl's Juniors. And when we arrived, it was mass confusion, the whole paparazzi thing. I really didn't give a shit. I just wanted to hang out and have a good time. Anyways, we had third row seats and the show was really cheesy and boring. We were smoking and drinking wine and all of a sudden we won this award. We weren't even really ready for it. I don't, want, I don't know what I said on stage, but it was short and sweet, and I don't think there were too many Fs in it. Then we went backstage. I met Lenny Kravitz, which was cool, but Prince blew us off. He and his entourage just ignored us when we walked by. He didn't say anything, and he probably didn't know who we were. 
I don't think uh, we're what he'd call good company, and I really didn't care. He looked like a fag anyway that night, and afterwards we went back to our seats, and when the second award came, it was totally unexpected. I got up to the microphone and started to thank all the people who helped us out over the years. I said the F word again and again, and I knew it was live television, so I said oops, but it just slipped out again and again, and once I started, that was it. It was just like using an adjective. Fast forward now almost 14 years later and Velvet Revolver's going on, Duff McKagan's doing interviews for VR, and he was asked during an interview, did you guys ever consider Prince for Velvet Revolver? And to which Duff said, oh dude, he's like the last mysterious guy. A couple weeks ago, someone asked me the four people I'd want to have dinner with, dead or alive. First guy I said was Prince, but then I rescinded because I wouldn't want to get to know him. I'd want that mystique to stay there. So following Prince's passing in 2016, paparazzi got a hold of Slash as well as Axel, who was about to go off and tour with ACDC and both revealed that they were devastated and about Prince's death and how they were both big Prince fans. Now, Guns N' Roses were set to play Coachella in April of 2016 and it was reported by numerous news outlets that the band would be doing a Prince song or doing some sort of tribute to Prince, but Axel himself admitted they didn't have enough time to get something together, so they dedicated the entire set to Prince that night. So Guns N' Roses in 2017, during their Not In This Lifetime tour, played Minneapolis and they paid tribute to Prince. So during the bands, uh, before the show even started, they would always have like music playing in the background before the band would come on stage. And they played nothing but Prince songs before their set. Also, Duff was seen uh, having uh, playing his bass with the Prince symbol on it. And the rock band also shared an image which included a Minnesota license plate that featured Prince's iconic symbol as the O in Minnesota. Duff even took some time off before the band's show to visit Paisley Park. So that does it for today's video, guys. Thanks for watching. Be sure to hit the like button and subscribe for all things related to GNR. And go check us out on GNRcentral.com for the latest Guns N' Roses news. Take care.